Hello, Global Gardeners. Great to see you again on another Monday. I'm joined by Mala today. She's at my side and wants a lot of attention, so hopefully she'll be lying down shortly and we can get to all the gardening topics that we want to talk about today, answer questions, talk about soil amending, some end of season and beginning of season activities that we should be thinking about. And it's always nice to see you all. Aloha to Mojo Palms. Welcome back to Doris and Nachi G. It's always nice to see everybody here on a Monday so we can talk some gardening. I want to go ahead and start with a question from Lila Lindholm. I'm actually working on a video on this topic right now. And uh, it'll probably come out later this week. But the question is, when do I plant my cover crop? Do I sacrifice the end of my growing season to make sure the cover crop has a chance to grow? Well, uh, I did talk a little bit about this a couple weeks ago, about the, the concept of trying to make those hard decisions of when to end the season for your plants, when to pull the plants, when to, to finish the harvest, and then start getting the beds ready for fall and or winter. And so that's part of the topic today is to actually discuss getting the soil ready to go. And that includes the cover crops. And so it, it depends. A lot of it depends on what kind of cover crop you're growing. And so as we've discussed before, there are a number of different reasons for having a cover crop. One reason is so that your soil is not bare through the winter so that you have some plants growing on the surface. One reason is so that it acts as a mulch to help keep any plants that might be growing in that bed uh, alive and keep the soil alive and keep the moisture level more consistent. It's like a living mulch. One of the most common reasons for a cover crop is what we also call green manure, where you use the plant material of the cover crop and then turn it into the soil to improve it. And then you can just grow cover crops partly because uh, of the benefits they offer. I like to grow hairy vetch. And in my area, hairy vetch flowers pretty early in spring. So I'll grow it as a cover crop from fall through winter into spring. And it's flowering before a lot of my other flowers are and now becomes food for the pollinator. So lots of reasons for cover crops. Because of all those different reasons, you're going to be growing lots of different types of plants as cover crops. And this is where the answer to the question comes in. You need to plant so that the seeds have enough time to germinate and begin growing based on your particular climate and weather conditions. So, for instance, last year I grew a lot of winter rye, which can handle some cold conditions. And I put the seeds in in October and it was just a few weeks before I actually started getting some regular frosts and freezes and the winter rye germinated and grew and it wasn't entirely evergreen but I had plants growing through most of the winter and then it was ready to go in spring and then I turned it into the soil about four to six weeks before I planted my spring crops and so the reason for that cover crop was to add organic material to the soil. For other plants, they might take longer to grow. Clover, for instance, is great as a, an uh, amendment for the soil to add nitrogen and also organic matter when you turn it in. But it takes longer to germinate and takes longer to grow. So September might be a good time to start your clover. So a lot of it depends on the type of seed. But because right now for many of us in the Northern Hemisphere, we're getting to the end of our season. If you're clearing out a bed and pulling the plants and amending the soil, now is probably a good time to start thinking about starting some of those cover crop seeds to give them plenty of time to grow. There are many legumes that, that grow through the winter, winter peas, for instance. They won't need as long to to germinate and grow, but if you want a full-size plant, then starting them earlier is better than later. So there really isn't a, a, a single answer for when to start cover crops, other than I don't think it's a good idea to have bare soil really at any time in your garden. 
And so if the bed is just going to be sitting there, go ahead and put a cover crop in. Go ahead and sow some seeds and at least have something growing. Even if the green manure or the cover crop never reaches full size, at least you've got something growing in that bed and you'll have organic matter ready to turn into the soil when you need it. And it kind of ties into a, a question that uh, Kevin had asked before we started the broadcast today. Had some corn and did some chop and drop and was wondering about how to amend the soil, how to get some of that organic matter into the soil if you're not using a tiller. And I haven't used my tiller in years and years and years. I used to do this annually, same type of thing. I would chop and drop in my garden. I would cut the plants. I would cut them into smaller pieces. I would take my tiller and I would till all that into the soil. And that's the standard farming practice where the farmers with their tractors till all of that organic matter back into the soil. But if you're not using a tiller, you still have to get it into the soil somehow. There's a couple ways that I approach doing this. One, in the fall, I showed this in a video last fall, I actually get out there with my shovel and I turn the soil over so that all that material that's on the top of the soil now is in the soil about six to eight inches deep based on, on how big a chunk of soil I can dig and turn. Now, sure. Anytime you dig in the soil, you are going to damage some of the soil structure. A tiller will pulverize the soil structure. Whereas a shovel, if you just dig and turn, you're doing minimal damage to your soil structure. But in the process, you're adding a lot of organic matter. So that's my preferred method is just a dig and turn, dig and turn to incorporate that matter. You can also just leave it on the surface as a mulch. And if you already have healthy soil conditions, then the earthworms and the beetles and all the other soil organisms will gradually incorporate that, that material from the top into the soil. It takes a lot longer. That's the basic concept behind no dig gardening is you just pile everything on top and let the creatures carry it down into the soil. But it helps to have good soil to start with. It helps if you have moist soil and wet conditions in your natural climate. Uh, otherwise, I turn it over and have to water my soil, water my beds to keep all of that soil life active. So there's a couple things to talk about. We'll talk more about amending as we move forward. Journey of involution to co-consciousness. Hello to you. Eating from our garden now. Canceled our salad box last week and this Friday canceling our veg box and only buying fruit now. That's so awesome. That's one of the, the best things about uh, the harvest season when you can get your garden going is you're not going to the store to buy as much or in this case, you're not having things delivered. You're not ordering all that food that you used to have to buy. Now instead you can grow it yourself and harvest it yourself. And I think that's awesome. Congratulations to you. Okay, Kevin is saying, I think you have a better back than me. I avoid my shovel like the plague. I actually don't have, and you know, I've talked about this before and you can see it in some of my videos. I have to wear a back brace every time I'm in the garden because my back is not that good. And that's one reason why I don't do a lot of effort. It's just a simple push the spade or shovel into the soil and turn it uh, without putting a lot of effort into it. And it's it's not a lot of of uh overworking my back because I might only do one bed a day and I might wait two days to do another bed but when it, I'm growing primarily in six raised beds and I'll be doing the same thing in the spring in my big area of raised beds but even my back can handle it so if I can handle it you can handle it as well. Rob's allotment is with us today good to see you in the UK Rob always oh, nice to have you here thanks for joining us uh, got a question from Hot Pepper Paul. One of my raised beds settled about six inches, so I added four inches of composted wood chips and topped it off with two inches of mushroom compost. I plan to plant directly into the compost. Uh, that, that could work. I would suggest if you do that, give it some time. Both the mushroom compost, mushroom compost tends to have, a, depending on where you got it, tends to have a lot of woody material in it. And especially with the composted wood chips, 
Um, it's going to take a while. Most of the wood chips and that mushroom compost are fungally active. So it's going to be the fungus that breaks down that material. And so allow a little bit of time for the fungus to start doing its job. There will also be bacteria at work. Both of those are going to be using some nitrogen in the process of breaking down. And plants need nitrogen. And so it may be, I'd say, at least a month before your soil stabilizes enough that you can plant in it. So for best results, give your, yourself as much time for all of that to, to begin breaking down and, and then allow the time for plants to grow. But that's, a, that's, a, that's another issue I wanted to talk about today as far as getting the beds ready, amending the soil. I like to use fall, autumn as my primary time of year to do this. And part of it is because over the course of the winter, through that decomposition of the mushroom compost and other things like that that I use, you're going to see your soil drop from spring through to the end of summer. And I have one bed, I showed it briefly in one of my videos a while back, that uh, I had about six to eight inches of soil surface drop because I had all of that organic matter in the soil. And so during the growing season, when you've got your plants actively growing in those beds, there's not much you can do to increase the volume in the bed, to add more material. You just kind of have to let those plants grow. You can maybe add some mulch, but that's not really good for the volume. But when the plants are out and it comes time to amend the beds and add more organic matter, you have to take into account all of that lost volume. And like in this case, uh, choosing to use uh, a compost and uh, decomposed wood chips. Uh, I, I like to use similar material. I'll also use raw materials that haven't broken down yet, like the, the lawn clippings and dried crushed leaves. Because I'm not going to be growing in that bed again until my uh, late spring, I typically have about eight months of the year I'm not growing in the beds. And so I can put in an awful lot of volume into those beds in fall, give the fall and winter and spring for those soil organisms to, to start populating and become healthy. So when I put the, my plants and seeds in in spring, the whole system is ready to go. And, and by doing that, I don't use any fertilizer. All of these plants, this is actually a photo of my garden this morning I'll talk about here in just a little bit. And I, I haven't used any fertilizer anywhere in my garden because I'm incorporating so much organic matter into the soil into the fall. But expect that volume drop. So have a plan, whether it's decomposed wood chips and mushroom compost or the raw ingredients like me or your own homemade compost, whatever it happens to be. But have a plan for how you're going to... Uh, replace all of that lost volume, all of that organic matter that you had last year that's now gone because it's it's been decomposed and sucked up by your plants and the other microorganisms. How are you going to replace all that and what are you going to use? And and the sky's the limit. I, I suggest you use whatever you have available in your landscape. You can buy all kinds of things, but you never really know the, the source of that material and how trustworthy it is. Whereas if you're using your own crushed leaves and your own uh, grass clippings and your own compost, that's what I would recommend because now you know the, the source, you know how the compost was made, and now that's really the best way to replace the volume of all the beds when the plants are gone. Carol Woodward, thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate that. Thank you for that contribution. It's a, a nice way to start the morning. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Taco Promotion says, just got potted blackberry starts. They're about three feet long. Should I trim them before planting in a larger pot or ground? Sweetie pie variety in South Florida zone 10. Uh, I, that's, that's good. I don't, I'm not familiar with the sweetie pie variety, but I hope it works well for you. And yeah, typically uh, for most starts like that, especially if they're three feet long, trimming them, cutting off the, you know, at least maybe a foot of the, the blackberry cane can help. Most of the plants, when we're putting them in a garden from a pot or putting into a bigger pot, we want root development 
to really kickstart, get going, and get that plant nice and healthy. And by transplanting, you'll be damaging some of the roots and you'll also be adding stress to the plant and to those roots. And so if you keep the full size plant that might be doing okay in the pot it's in right now because it's got the root structure to support that plant, well, now you take that same plant and put it into a pot or put it into the ground with that root damage and that stress, now the roots may not be enough to support a full-size plant. And so that's a big reason to prune plants when we transplant so that there's less of the plant for the root system to support, allowing the roots to become more established and then putting the energy into the plant to to grow better. So uh, that's, you know, you, you see uh, a lot of a lot of people recommend doing that. And a lot of it depends on the plant. You know, I don't, I'm not going to be um, pruning and cutting back a plant like a pumpkin or a squash that I'm transplanting because it doesn't work the same. But when you're looking, or when you're talking about a softwood or a hardwood, some pruning at planting is, is usually a good idea. And there's a super sticker from Prepper Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that as well. I always appreciate the support and the contributions. That's that's awesome. Thank you. That's always a nice way to, to start the day. Okay, let's see what else we have. Heidi's saying, I personally love biochar. I apply it to every garden bed I have. It's great for giving the microbes something to colonize on. And that's another good transition to the subject of the day. I've got a, a video on biochar where I talk about what it is and how to use it in the garden. I mention it in some of my videos where I talk about filling the beds and uh, getting the, the soil life active. And so I agree with you, Heidi. I personally love biochar as well. And so biochar uh, is, can be misunderstood, and, and I go into it in much more detail in that video. So I suggest you, you look up my biochar video for more information. But biochar is different than charcoal. Now, it's, it is all uh, basic, basically the same. Okay, so when you're talking about that black stuff that you're going to put in your soil, it's all carbon. The difference is how it's processed and what other ingredients might be in it. And so biochar is processed through pyrolysis. And in the pyrolysis process, it burns away all the tar, all of the the chemicals that might be in whatever the product that they're starting with, usually a wood-based product. It's burning away all of the volatile gases and all that's left is essentially pure carbon. And the structure of the biochar is what makes it so incredibly amazing. You just have all these micro holes, these little pores throughout the biochar. And those pores, when you add the biochar to your soil, are filled with bacteria. It becomes a, a condominium for bacteria in your soil and a repository for the nutrients that that bacteria is producing. You can make your own charcoal and add it to your compost or your soil, but you're not getting such a, a, a true uh, in, ingredient of, of carbon. When you have the, the, the charcoal that you're using or that you make, it might have tars and it might have those volatile chemicals that could adversely affect some of the soil life. And so if you're thinking about those kind of additives to your soil, I strongly suggest doing a refined biochar that has been produced in the pyrolysis process and then you get the great benefits. And it's one of those one-time applications. Because it's, it's essentially pure carbon, it's not going to break down. It's not going to decompose. And so it stays in the soil for years and years and years and continues to be that repository for nutrients and beneficial bacteria. So uh, thanks for, for mentioning that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jay. There's a, a link in the comments to to my biochar video. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it is just an incredible uh, ingredient. And, and I've worked with a couple different biochar companies over the years to test products. And, and it, it, it's amazing. Side-by-side -side tests that I've done, 
in bed with bi biochar versus a bed without biochar and the plants in the biochar beds always do better so when i talk about amending your beds in spring or, or fall i do a lot of talking about that organic matter like i already have adding something like biochar is definitely something you should add to your your thought process because it is just a one-time application uh, it's not cheap but because you only use it once uh, the the price actually ends up being um, amortized if you will over however long you're growing in that bed so it actually works pretty well okay let's see Jan Zeely says hello from South Africa I love your channel it got me started gardening in my second year there's a lot of beetle grubs in my soil soil wondering if there's an organic way to repel them well hello to you from South Africa as well uh, I'm not sure what you have available in South Africa but there are a number of ways that you, you can control the, the beetle grubs. There are some beneficial nematodes, which is a, a really interesting biological and very effective way to control grubs if you know the particular type of grub. And because they're, they're specialized, the nematodes that you might buy can, are specialized for what they attack in, in the soil. Uh, an, another thing that you could try to do is actually control the beetle and the life cycle of the beetle and I, I talk about this a lot where if you can identify the pest specifically you might be able to use something like diatomaceous earth to control the beetle so that the beetle dies before it lays eggs but if you don't control the beetle and you have identified exactly what type it is now you can do a simple online search and find out where it lays its eggs and so some of these beetles will lay eggs in soil. Some of these beetles will lay eggs in the stem of the plant. Some of the beetles will lay eggs on the underside of the leaves. And so once you understand the specific pest, you can start looking for the eggs so that they never turn into a larva, which is what, what the grub is. And so even the, the beetles that lay the eggs on the plant or on the leaves, when those eggs hatch, the larva typically will either bore into the plant or crawl down into the soil and then begin growing in the soil. And so by understanding that type of insect, now you might be able to disrupt the soil, dig up. Another great reason why I like to turn over my soil, because I do have some of those grub issues in my garden. Every time I turn over my soil, particularly in the spring, I find grubs and so that's one way that i help keep some of my beetle problems and borer problems under control is because i'm turning over the soil exposing those grubs and allowing the birds to to find them and also i pick them out and, and that is one time actually you know, i talk about not leaving your beds uncovered but when i turn over my soil uh, depending on the bed, depending if it is one of those areas that might have an insect problem, I'll leave the soil exposed for a couple days so that the, the sun might bake the top of the soil and kill some of those grubs. The birds will come in and eat some of those grubs, and then I'll cover it with mulch. If the bed is clean from pests, then I'll mulch right after turning the soil and watering it, and then I like to mulch with with dried leaves and straw and and the grass clippings but there's a that's that's really the best way looking into the future is to really try to know what the pest is and then determine if diatomaceous earth or nematodes or turning the soil and disrupting the the habitat of of that particular insect is really best and so there's a couple ideas that that might help you in in that that direction uh, yeah and joseph says uh, i'm a chemical free gardener and that's why i suggest this because i'm a chemical free gardener as well and so i'm looking for those natural and more um, biological controls if i can if i can get away with it uh, particularly in the vegetable garden if i'm going to be eating something i don't want to spray any type of chemicals now that being said that's me that's joseph if you have an infestation that is so bad in your area and you need to use chemicals, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's that's your own choice. That's your garden. You can do whatever you want. And so I try to keep everything under control to the point 
that I never have to revert to the, the option of chemicals. And it can be a lot of work. And I do a lot of hand picking of insects. But for instance, last year, I had uh, a few uh, squash beetles start to appear and I plucked them off as soon as I could. I made an effort to clean up all of the old plants from my garden, threw some of it in the compost, turned over the soil, and I, I haven't seen a squash bug this year. And so, you know, knock on wood, I'm lucky. I'm not saying that I eliminated the problem, but I've reduced the issue so that last year I saw some of those pests and this year I haven't. And so if you stay on top of it and you do some of this, you should be able to get it under control, especially when you start attracting all those other beneficial insects and the birds by planting the flowers and the grasses and the herbs and all those other plants. So you have a great variety, a huge diversity in your garden of plants, which will give you a diversity of good insects, which should eliminate or greatly reduce the number of bad insects that you have. So yeah, and Ash says, I might try spraying with beneficial nematodes next year. Uh, I haven't used nematodes a lot, but it is one of those things that you can definitely learn more about and use to your advantage. Kevin's saying, do you consider BT, spinosad, or pyrethrum chemicals? Um, technically, the organic. So I don't consider BT a chemical because it's a bacteria and, and similar to the spinal sad. But pyrethrum, I consider that a chemical. And pyrethrum can actually be quite toxic. There, there are warnings on labels if you use that. Yes, it is an organic control, to, and you can use it in, in an organic garden. Um, but even something like that, I'm not, I'm not using it because I do consider that a chemical. And, and I know, and I've been corrected on this by, by some people in the past, everything is a chemical. Everything is chemical-based. And so when I'm talking chemicals, I'm, I'm usually talking about um, either an artificial um, chemical that is often petroleum based, or in this case, something that is made, even though it's made organically, to control pests as, as a killer, as a pesticide or an herbicide. And so in that case, yes, I consider those chemicals and, and in this case, context uh, harmful chemicals so bt nope i don't i don't think that's an issue i don't really have a big issue with spinosad but but the pyrethrum i do and a lot of those other um, herbicides and pesticides even if they're organic if their intent is to to kill by using a toxic substance that's when i stay away from them. whereas bt works completely different it, it's a bacteria that gets into whatever it's attacking and then kills the insect like a caterpillar from the inside out. And that's the way BT works. So it's, it's not a chemical. That is a biological control. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Earthy Artist is saying, I use a neem oil, water, Castile soap mixture. And the same with neem oil. I don't really consider, um, though neem oil is a chemical, I don't really consider that as a chemical either because it it acts differently. It's not a toxic substance that is killing the the insect pest through its toxicity. It just gets in and messes with the brain and the 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 insect itself so that it stops eating and it's perfectly safe to use around people and animals. And the Castile soap is a nice way to um, to get it to actually um, stick to some of the leaves. So that's a very common method of using neem oil. I, I, I get by with just neem oil, water, and just a drop of dish soap. Same basic, I, I, I think. Okay, let's see what Growing with Donnie says. <coughs> uh, tad off topic, no problem. Should I be changing out potting soil uh, if the plant I'm taking out had powdery mildew? Uh, yes and no. I, I'm not as concerned about powdery mildew as some other gardeners are. Powdery mildew is the spores are everywhere, everywhere. And so if you have a, a really serious problem with powdery mildew, you can expect that some of those spores are going to be in that soil. 
if you put a plant in that soil and then mulch over that soil, well, you're now basically putting a barrier between those spores and the plants. And so that's another reason why I'm a huge advocate of mulch, because our soils have billions and billions of different spores of all kinds of things, most that we've never even heard of. But if you can put a barrier between your soil and your plant, you should have fewer issues. And this holds true with powdery mildew. So even if you know you have a problem with powdery mildew, by mulching the soil, you can use that soil again and put plants into it. And I'm not that concerned about it personally. Uh, if, if it's a really bad infestation, sure, change out the potting soil and start fresh. But that may not change anything. Uh, two years ago, and I, when I first started my garden, I built brand new beds. I brought in fresh soil. I started growing. And so last year was my first full year of gardening, and I had powdery mildew. Where did it come from? I had no other plants anywhere in that area. There hadn't been a garden in this house probably ever, and I had powdery mildew. The spores are everywhere. So you can do everything right to include mulching, but if a spore blows in on the wind and lands on the leaf, you could get a problem with powdery mildew. And that's why I say I'm not that concerned by it because as plant diseases go, it's not that big a deal. It typically happens later in the season when the plant is already starting to decline anyway. And so that helps give me a reason to pull that plant is because it's fading as a result of its age, the weather, and the powdery mildew. And so um, that's my basic thought on that. Uh, your choice whether you want to make the effort to actually change out the soil. But by changing the soil does not mean you're going to be eliminating the, an issue with powdery mildew. And that's that's basically the, the approach I take as I... Uh, move forward with my amending, with my mulching, with preparing the beds for the winter, with all that kind of stuff. And so let me talk a little bit about uh, the background today, which is in my garden. And I'm still looking for your garden pictures. If you want to send me one to Gardener Scott at gardenerscott.com and I'll add it to the queue. A lot of the pictures that I have, I've already shown. Or when I got the pictures from you, I didn't get the explicit explicit permission to use the photo and as I've said before unless you send me your photo and say this is okay to use on your live stream I'm not going to use it and so got some great photos from a lot of you thanks for updating uh, some of the stuff I've shown in the backgrounds before I've, I've gotten updates with the, the garden as it looks now it looks great but uh, in a couple of the cases I would love to show some of those updated photos but I don't have the permission to do so. So today I'm showing you my garden as it as it approaches the end of season. This bed right here I've got covered with shade cloth, and it's been covered with shade cloth from the beginning. And you can start to you can see in this bed some of the the lettuce and the kale, and I've got some chard back here, and there's some Brussels sprouts that are just starting to grow. And, and my temperatures have been 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit above average. And so it, it's been weeks that we've been around 92, 93 degrees Fahrenheit, about 33 degrees Celsius. And I was able to start all of these cool season plants underneath the shade cloth in the garden. As we start cooling down, hopefully in the days ahead, I'll remove the shade cloth and let everything recover. Um, over in this bed right here, the carrots will be ready to harvest soon. I'm letting the last of these beans go to seed. These are rattlesnake beans, and so I'll be saving those seeds to plant next year. The kohlrabi just got too hot and never really developed. And then over here, you can see the, the potatoes that are beginning to turn brown, and I'll be harvesting those. So this whole bed, will be ready for me to amend and prepare for the winter here in just the next couple weeks. And then this bed back here, those are radishes. Uh, I'll be finishing up that video on saving radish seeds soon. And so I'll be clearing out that bed. This bed over here I showed in a recent video. 
Uh, I just haven't had the time to get to it, but I'm cleaning out that bed to get ready. And so in all three of these beds, I'll be putting in cover crops. And so when we talk cover crops, they're often thought of as like a wide open area, your big in-ground bed, you're growing clover and then you till it in, or you're growing vetch and then you turn it over. But you can do cover crops in raised beds, just a four by eight raised bed like I have. I'll be growing some cover crops in. Now, this this bed back here, these are my tomatoes, which are giving me some, some great cherry tomatoes right now, very prolific. That bed's gonna stay growing until the frost comes and kills those plants. And so when it comes to preparing your beds and amending your beds to go into winter, or at the beginning of the season, if you're preparing your beds to get ready going into spring and summer, don't think that you have to do everything all at once at the same time. And that's one reason why I wanted to show this, is to show that, that this bed right here is probably two or three weeks away from me clearing out, and then I'll go ahead and put a cover crop in it. This bed is just a couple days away from being cleared out, and then I'll put a cover crop in it. This bed over here is maybe two weeks away before I actually get that video finished and, and pull out those radishes and get that bed ready to go. These tomatoes, maybe a month away before I get a freeze and clear out that bed. The, the bed right here where it's covered by the shade cloth, I probably got at least two months before I need to worry about that bed because all of those plants can handle frost. So from this week for the next two months, I'll be getting all of these beds ready to go, amending, mulching, put them to rest for the winter at different times based on when the plants are done and when I'm done growing in that bed. And I may still um, do something with the rest of these beds. Now, this bed back here uh, is, is gonna get some cover crops, but because of the timing, I will probably do uh, my garlic in this bed right here based on when I'm pulling the plants out. And so that's another factor, is what you're going to do with the bed, not just the amending, but any follow-on plants. And so uh, I may end up putting the garlic in this bed. So I'll pull these plants, amend it, let it rest for about a month, and then put the garlic in. So don't think that you have to have all of this figured out right away. It can be an evolving process based on how much time you have, based on which plants are in that bed right now and when they're done and what you're gonna be doing with that bed moving forward in your growing season. In the springtime, it's the, it's the same basic idea where if I've got plants that are growing like the spinach and the lettuce and the chard, they might be growing in early spring. I typically don't amend right before I plant. So I'll amend my beds in autumn. The bed will be ready in spring if I am going to be putting the lettuce and the spinach and the radishes and those kind of plants in early spring, I won't have done anything with the soil because it was prepared the previous autumn. Then when I pull those plants, I might add a little bit of compost before I then start tomatoes or peppers or squash or cucumbers in that same bed to be able to keep a season going and get multiple harvests from a single bed. But if the bed has been sitting all winter long and I'm not doing any spring crops, I might go ahead and do a second amending in the springtime so that I just give an extra boost of organic matter to that bed and then plant directly in the late spring or, or early fall with my pepper plants or my tomato plants or whatever the summer crop happens to be. So I, I don't follow the same exact process every single year with every single bed. Some beds get double amending, especially for those beds that fell six or eight inches in volume in the previous year. I'll often do a, an autumn and a spring amending of that bed just to get a lot of organic matter incorporated and bring that level back up. But for a bed that the previous year got double amending, 
I'll only do one amending the following year because I, I just don't need to add as much nutrients. And so think think on those along those lines. Be flexible with your plan and modify it based on what's happening in your garden, how much time you have. Back to the issue of, of a sore back. That's why I say I may only do one amending of a bed in a day because it's spread out over the course of a month or more. And so I don't have to hurt myself by doing all of this all in the same day. And that, that's one way to, to save your health and save your body when you do that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Rachel's asking, can you touch on winterizing potting soil for grow bags? Have 40 bags. That's awesome. Okay, and so um, a couple different things you can do as far as winterizing your grow bags. Now, uh, again, as I showed in my uh, amending video last year, one of the things I'll do in the grow bags, especially if you've got 40 bags, you might consider doing this. <coughs> I, I take some of the soil in the grow bags because most of the time I'm starting fresh each year in my grow bags with a brand new potting soil blend. And I use my own blend of peat moss and perlite and compost. And so I'll, I'll take that, that soil that was in those bags and that's what I'm amending my raised beds with. And so uh, like this bed right here, that's what I did last year. And I think I actually showed this in the video. The amending of this bed right here last year was from grow bags. And so I just dumped the grow bags in mixed it up. I actually didn't turn over much of that. I left up most of it sitting on the soil. Same with this bed right here. I just dumped grow bags, grow bag soil on top of it and then planted into it. And all the plants this year did fine. So that's one option for the soil in your grow bags. As far as overwintering, I would suggest doing some type of mulch if you're going to be leaving the bags outside because the sun can be intense. And so you can't see my grow bags there. They're behind the tomatoes here. But I did that on, on some of my grow bags last year. I took grass clippings and just covered the soil that was in the grow bags with grass clippings. And they sat out through the winter and did fine. And then in the spring, they were ready to start. I did, uh, I did boost with some uh, organic fertilizer, some slow-release fertilizer. I like to do that in the spring in my grow bags because uh, you just, well, you could do an analysis, but I operate under the assumption that the plants in those grow bags in the previous year used up a lot of the nutrients. And so by adding or an organic fertilizer in spring in my grow bags, uh, I have good success with the plants growing well for the second season. Uh, if you, depending on the size of your grow bags, if you've got the space and you wanna bring them inside, you don't have to use a mulch. You can just bring the, the grow bags into a garage or a shed and let them sit there through the winter and then put them back outside. Now, in all cases, in most cases, I should say, if you're winterizing or overwintering the soil in your grow bag, it's probably going to dry out and the, the, the soil microorganisms are probably going to die or at least go dormant through the entire winter months. And so in the spring, that's why I revitalize a little bit of um, the, the organic fertilizer. I'll often add some compost before I start potting again. And I do that at least three to four weeks before I plant so that the soil life in those grow bags can start revitalizing itself and repopulating and get ready for the plants. And so, uh, one way to plant in grow bags right away that you've overwintered is to keep the soil moist during the overwintering process, or at least bring them out, thaw them out, and begin watering as early in spring as you can so that you can get all that microbial action jump started before you're put, you put your plants in in the springtime. So, so there's a couple ideas about overwintering um, the grow bags, whether you want to use the soil for another purpose, and, and in my case, because I've, I'm, I'm using some pretty big grow bags uh, I, and because my winters are you know, filled with snow and 
freezing conditions and I'm not going to be doing a lot with the soil during the winter. That's one reason why I like to just go ahead and add that soil to my raised beds and then start fresh every year. But with 40 bags, that's definitely going to take a lot of work. And rudimental gardening has 70 bags. That's crazy. I mulch them with leaves and leave them outside over the winter. There you go. That mulch is a great idea. In the spring, dump two or three into a wheelbarrow and then mix 50% compost and refill them in fertilizer. There you go. Great idea. Um, same basic idea I was talking about. I like the way that, that you're doing it. Uh, and, and so the difference when I say I add compost, I actually do it to the grow bag because I don't have that many grow bags. And so I'll just dump some compost to get in with a trowel in my hands and mix it within the grow bag. But I like the idea of the wheelbarrow. That's a real good idea for doing a whole bunch of bags, especially when you've got that many. So thanks for that tip, rudimental gardening. I think that's a that's a good idea, uh, especially when you're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Colorado Bird Nerd, thank you for that contribution. I appreciate the super chat. I'm quite new to veggie gardening. I'm working on a personal gardening planner. Things were so haphazard this year. Good for you. Uh, I've been working on a personal gardening planner too, so that I can actually make a video to to show you how to do a personal gardening planner. But uh, one reason why I haven't done a video like that yet is because my method it tends to be just a, a spiral notebook and I just write myself notes and plans and sketches and it's really not a formalized process. So I'm actually starting to try to figure out how I could formalize what I do to share that with you and do a video so that you can develop your own. But I think that's great because and and I, I think a, a personal garden planner is exactly that. It's personal. You should personalize it to whatever works best for you. And so this this is a really good time of year for everybody. So if you're ending your gardening season, start making notes on what went right, what went wrong. If you're beginning your gardening season and you're just just getting into the the springtime, start do the same thing. Do that analysis from hopefully the notes you made last year and come out with a plan for what you're going to do this next year. And so whether it's a spiral notebook or you do it through a spreadsheet, I think that's that's a great idea is working on the personal garden planner. And and some of the things I might suggest to avoid the haphazardness of it is uh, the things that worked well for you, the the patterns you develop, the watering schedules you figured out, the pests you had, the things that, that you've already figured out and lay that out. I mean, actually, that's why I say a spreadsheet is a great way to just lay out all the lessons learned, anything that you think you should repeat for next year. And so as you figure out the plan, then you can start doing things like filling in the blanks. And so if you discovered that you really love growing beans, well, okay, part of the plan is to grow beans. The holes are what kind of beans are you going to grow? And so I've mentioned um, the rattlesnake beans in, in today and in, in other live streams. Maybe that jogs your mind to say, hey, I think I might try rattlesnake beans. I've never grown them before. I've got a video that, that's coming out here real soon about shishito peppers. And it's one of those peppers very few gardeners are growing. Well, it's the same kind of thing. If you decide that you want to grow some peppers and you had great success with cayenne peppers, and now you want to try something different, well, shishito peppers might be something to do and for next season. And so that's how I approach a lot of this garden planning is to have a basic framework of what I'm going to do based on what has worked well for me in the past. And then I just fill in the holes or uh, modify it based on what I want to try new or old. And a lot of that changes with the weather, what's happening. I may have a plan for growing a particular crop and then the weather doesn't cooperate or or I, I lose the seed packet or the seed packet gets covered up by a, a tray of seedlings. And so there's lots of things that, that can get in the way. So you can have your plan, be flexible with it. Um, but yes, definitely personalize it and do it in a way that, that you really enjoy 
and that keeps you getting out into the garden. So, but I think that's awesome. And uh, Rachel's saying, I have a mix of written notes on a three ring binder and a phone diary that allows me to write notes and take pictures. Awesome, awesome way to do it. And I don't know that it's necessarily a bad habit, but I've fallen into a new way of doing things, which is video. And so <clears throat> I've, I've mentioned this a time or two in the past, uh, but, uh, but yes, I like the video diary idea as well, or the photo diary. And so one reason that I shoot my videos the way I do is as a photo diary or a video diary for me. So that, uh, and I, I do this often, where I'm trying to remember what was it I was growing or what was it I was planning to do. And I'll go back to one of my videos because I knew or I remember that I shot that video so that I could show something in the background so that I could reference for myself if I ever needed to. And so I make my videos for you, but I also make them for me as a video diary. And that's, that's a good way. It's worked well for me. And I reference myself all the time. And so whatever you find works for you, three wing, three ring binders, spiral notebooks, photos, videos, all that stuff. It, it's just important to keep track of it. It's important to have an idea of what you did so that you can either repeat it if you want to or not repeat it uh, to avoid a problem that you might have had uh, before. Anand, hello to you. Haphazard is when you just sow more than you can manage to eat or maintain. That's a good point. There's so much that happens in the garden that um, it might be a happy little accident in, in the way that it ends up uh, benefiting your garden. So I, I appreciate that. That's some good idea. Okay, let's see what else. I just saw something uh, Michael Spaulding is saying. First year growing strawberry plants. How should I go about pruning them for winter? And so I don't prune my strawberry plants going into the winter. And and you, you probably see um, some different information on this. Maybe that's why you're asking the question. And so I'm in zone 5B. I've been growing strawberries for decades. I've got four different kinds of strawberries in my garden right now. I get a lot of cold, a lot of dry air, and uh, a good amount of snow during the winter. And so I don't prune my strawberries. I, I keep them growing full size. At the end of the season, when we start getting that cold and that snow, the leaves will turn brown. And I just leave the leaves on the strawberry plants. And I allow the leaves to become a protective mulch over the, the plant. And I've never had an issue with the plants uh, not surviving the, the winter because you want to keep the crown covered and as dry as possible. And the leaves do that naturally. The only time I've had problems with strawberries not making it through the winter is when I pruned off the, the leaves earlier and the, the plant suffered. The crown got frozen and the plant didn't survive. Now, you can prune off those dried leaves if you choose to, but then you should consider adding a mulch on top of it, like a straw mulch or a wood chip mulch or something else to help protect the plants, depending on how cold you get. If you're in um, 6B or above, you may not to do, need to do anything to your strawberries, but if you get some harsher conditions in the winter, those crowns and those plants are going to need to be covered by something, some type of mulch, and I just allow the plant to mulch itself, and and it does fine, and and uh, it it always comes back. Uh, she knows keto prepared homestead says I want to plant strawberries, but always have trouble finding plants. I got all my plants online, and I've gotten them. I'm trying to think, oh, I, I shouldn't say all my plants online. I've got most of my plants online. I think I got some from Fedco. I think I got some from Stark Brothers. Uh, and and uh, there's some, another source I can't think of that I've gotten my strawberry plants from. So I've gotten them from a few different places online. Um, I also have some strawberries that I've propagated year after year for the last 20 years. And uh, those are the Quinault strawberries that I just love. 
And so I got those from myself. But uh, just do some quick searches online and you shouldn't have any trouble finding some good sources for strawberries. And in, in most areas in spring, you can go to a nursery and buy live plants. And so your choice is to, uh, if you order online, you're going to get uh, the, the dormant crowns and roots, and they're going to be bare root plants. And so typically they're sold in groups of like 20 or 25 strawberries. They'll come wrapped up by a rubber band, and you just have to separate all of these little dry roots and crowns and plant them in early spring. And then the plant will grow and you'll have your strawberries. It takes some time for the plant to recover and actually start putting out the leaves and the fruit. Depending on the variety, you may or may not get fruit in that first year. If you want strawberries for sure in your first year and you're just about ready to start a strawberry bed, uh, you might go with live plants from a nursery. And that can be a real good way to, to get a strawberry bed, strawberry bed going from the very beginning. Hey, Sonom, great to see you here again on Monday. Love your video about the dogs. Have my own problem with my dog. Maybe it will work. It won't hurt to try. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I did a video this weekend introducing uh, my new garden buddy, Mala, and talked a little bit about getting her prepared for the garden and, and dogs in particular. And I've had some great comments from those of you that, that have seen that video. Um, that They can be a problem. <clears throat> I mentioned my chocolate, chocolate lab, Shaka, who used to chase the squirrels across the garden. And I, I'd forgotten, I, I meant to mention it in the video, um, but I didn't. But one of my favorite stories uh, of her is her getting in the garden and, and harvesting for me green tomatoes. And she almost every day would bring a green tomato into the house. And it took me a while to figure it out, but... But my analysis is that she thought it was a green tennis ball because I used to play fetch with her with a green tennis ball. And when she was ready to play fetch, she'd go out to the garden and grab a green tomato and bring it in. And that was her way of telling me it was time to play fetch. And so uh, as much as we love our, our animals, sometimes they can be a little frustrating. But even then, I look back on that with a great sense of warmth uh, just having her during that time. And it, it was worth having a, a few lost tomatoes just to spend the time in the garden with her. So um, it's it's fun to have the pets, and I, that can be a challenge, Ace, but I uh, hope it all works well for you. Yankee Sista, always good to see you on Mondays. Thanks for that super chat. Happy Monday to you. School's begun, so I'm back to replays, enjoying being able to preserve summer harvest. Enjoy your week. You enjoy your week as well, and enjoy preserving your harvest. That's awesome. Uh, that's one of the best things that I like doing. I, and I actually, uh, I, I, I end up doing, in some cases, more preserving than I actually do eating fresh, depending on the size of the harvest. So uh, I've got some videos on that. We've talked about that, a lot of that before. But if you're not preserving, then you should start preserving. And so good for you, Yankee Sister, to, to be preserving your harvest because that's exactly what you should be doing. And hope the school year goes well, and I hope you can uh, join us on Mondays as often as possible. I do want to remind you, I mentioned it last week, but I will not be here next Monday. Uh, it is a holiday in the United States, but I'll be on the road on my garden tour of the, the, the southwest of the U.S., and so I won't be live next week, but I will be back the week after that. And so I'll be I'll be gone September 6th, but I'll be here normal time, normal everything on September 13th. So if you show up next week and I don't show up, uh, that's what happened. And, and I'll I'll post that on my channel and I'll say it again at the end of this um, live stream. But uh, I appreciate you all being here on Mondays. I just won't be here next Monday, and it's one of those things that, uh, sorry that I'll miss you, but hopefully you'll you'll see why when I do some of those videos of the, the gardens I'll visit. Sheena's homestead, I love your preserving videos. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I would do more preserving videos, and I am planning more preserving videos. Thank you, because I like them too. Of my favorite videos, uh, 
some of my preserving videos are actually my favorite videos. The issue is that, believe it or not, this is craziness of YouTube, but a lot of viewers come to my channel to see the gardening videos, how to do this, how to plant, how to do soil, how to do whatever. And they aren't as interested in preserving. So I've got some of my preserving videos that I think are pretty good videos, but I lose subscribers when I come out with a preservation video because that's what a lot of, I won't say a lot, that's what some of the viewers uh, um, of my gardening videos see they don't want to see ever again and so they unsubscribe from the channel which is kind of discouraging and i try not to let it affect me too much all of us on youtube have this issue with pe losing people because of a video we make but i think preservation is an important aspect of gardening i think you should learn to garden and you should learn to preserve so you're watching this, you're watching my other videos, I encourage you watch some of my preservation videos and then start putting it all together because it does fit all together. It's not an either or. I could have a whole separate channel on how to preserve your harvest, but I don't want it to be an either or. I want it to be all the above. And so uh, think about that, especially if you're new to gardening, learn how you can preserve some of the crops that you're harvesting because too often we harvest more than we can use and uh, it ends up in the compost pile. And if you know how to preserve it, you can avoid, not the compost is a waste, but you can avoid wasting that fresh material that you grew for the purpose of eating. Love always, Jasmine, hi to you. Can I move established peppers to a different raised bed or will that kill the plant? It has some fruit on it already. Yeah, you can. Um, peppers actually transplant fairly well um, you can overwinter pepper plants very easily dig them out of your beds put them into pots put them into a protected area or indoors during the winter and then put them back back out in the spring so of the plants we grow peppers are among the easiest to do that with doesn't work that well with tomatoes doesn't work that well at all with squashes or melons or pumpkins or anything like that but you can do it with peppers kind of what i was talking about in the beginning with the blackberry cane where you you might want to prune off a blackberry cane when you're transplanting it same basic idea with a pepper if it's got fruit on it and you want to go ahead and move it uh, it's not going to kill the plant but i would go ahead and and take off any fruit that's growing on it and pinch off any new flowers just so it can start getting established in its new spot so that the energy of the plant can be directed towards the roots so that that plant will will anchor better and not to the fruit because if you transplant a plant that has fruit on it that puts stress on the plant and it tells the plant that its life is about to end, something tragic is happening, and it's gonna put all of its energy into ripening that fruit so that that fruit can produce the seeds to, to, to grow the next generation. And the plant will essentially sacrifice itself for that fruit. But if you cut off the fruit, now you're forcing the plant to survive because the plant still wants to produce that fruit and seed, but the fruit is gone. So you're forcing the plant to survive so that it can produce more flowers and more fruit. And that's the big reason why we, we cut off fruit and flowers when we transplant. But yeah, go ahead and, and do that because um, I think you'll find that, that peppers actually work pretty well with all that kind of stuff. And there's actually, I don't think that's a weird story, Jay. Someone jumped, dumped a perfectly healthy three-foot pepper plant by the roadside, salvaged and growing peppers. There you go. Perfect example of how peppers can be extremely resilient and grow again. And so um, I think it's sad that someone would dump a perfectly good plant, but I think it's awesome that you went ahead and rescued it and that you're uh, growing some more of the the, the fruit and probably will have some good harvest. There's Mage Gray Wolf. I did that with the last of my tomatoes. I cut off everything but the parts with fruit. There you go. Uh, yeah, it you know it, it's one of those ways to just definitely um, 
understand how a plant works so that you can give the plant the best chance for survival. And a lot of it has to do with the fruit and the stage of growth of the plant and where the energy is going with that particular plant. So, okay, let's see what else we have popping up here in the way of questions. Uh, oh, I, I did want to also mention when it talks about, or when I talk about amending the beds, uh, when it comes time to amend, and, and I rarely talk about this, and it's one of those topics I don't think uh, is really talked about much at all, but I have all my raised beds. I love my raised beds. I think raised bed gardening is great, but one of the problems with raised bed gardens is people begin to think of it as a permanent garden. And a benefit of raised beds is that you can move them to a new location. And so if you set up your garden, particularly a raised bed garden, and you have since discovered that it's not in the best location and you would really rather have your raised bed garden someplace else, well, when it comes time to amend the soil, that's a great time to move your bed. And so go ahead and dig out as much of that soil as you can, put it into a wheelbarrow, move the bed to another spot. And now as you fill the bed in the new spot, you can amend it during that process. So I think amending during the filling of the bed is, is really a great way to go. And I do that with all my beds, starting with that Hugo Holter Foundation and then adding soil and amendments on top of that. Well, consider moving your garden and using that as a reason to amend or vice versa. When it's time to amend your garden, use that as a reason to move your garden to another location. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Karen W is saying, Gardener Scott, then plant out, say, next early spring or two years from now after hardening off. Uh, okay, and so I, I, I'm not sure if we're still talking about um, the peppers, but uh, yes, that's that's basically the idea. If we're overwintering something, you you will need to harden off before you put it back into the ground. And so if you're growing peppers in pots, for instance, and during the winter, you're moving the pots indoors and putting them in a sunroom or growing them under lights. Anytime you're going to move plants that have been growing in a sheltered, protected area with consistent conditions, and then you're putting them outside, you should harden them off. Even if it's a, a two or three or four year old pepper plant, it, it won't need as lengthy a hardening off process as a young seedling, but you should still consider hardening it off. I do the same thing when I put out fruit bushes and fruit trees. I will harden them off to some degree, depending on the time of year that I'm putting them outside. If they're dormant plants, then I'll put them directly into the ground. But often I'll be shipped a plant that I order from a nursery in spring. It's supposed to be a dormant bare root plant. Instead, it arrives with leaves on it. And if I were to put that directly in my garden, in my climate, either the freeze or the sun would fry off those leaves and I've lost plants as a result of that. So um, I have an old, old video where I talk about that, where I, I, I get a shipment, I got a shipment of some of those kind of plants and actually potted them up so that they continued to grow in that sheltered environment. And then I hardened them off before I planted them outside in their final location. So um, hardening off, I think, is, is almost always a good idea uh, before you put them outside. And so, uh, yeah, definitely you can grow something inside for a year or two uh, and then put them outside after that hardening off process. So <clears throat> Sheena's saying, I never had luck with elderberry seeds, but I did cuttings and it worked out amazing. Um, that's actually, uh, I, I, I had a video, I've had amazing luck with elderberry cuttings as well. And uh, the at the school garden, the Galileo garden, I put in, I think, three or four elderberry plants, all from cuttings. And so a couple years ago, before I moved to this new garden at my last house, I had taken some cuttings from my elderberry plant. I was going to 
to root them and grow them. And so I started filming. I did the whole process. I was going to make a video about how easy it is to do elderberry cuttings and get more plants. And those cuttings didn't make it. And so I would never release that video because it was a failure. But yes, from seed, elderberries can be grown. They don't grow as well, but they're great to grow from cutting and extremely easy. Um, you just got to get the right kind of wood. And I think the wood I was using was too old, uh, which is why it didn't root. And so uh, you you want some uh, some of the cuttings to have some soft wood and some uh, hardwood, and that tends to work out a little bit better. But uh, glad to hear it. It's one of those things that you can uh, experiment with. Uh, a lot of cuttings. And uh, I just put in the ground this weekend uh, some plants that I did from cuttings. And uh, it's it's a, a, a hedge plant. And so I took cuttings from my buddy Steve. And I'm not exactly sure what kind of plant it is. And so before I tell you, I actually need to do some research on a key to identify it. But I took cuttings a year ago, rooted them over the winter, put them in pots in the spring, and they've been hardening off for about a month or so. And I just put them in uh, this week. And earlier in the season, I did some cuttings from my yew plants. Same thing. Those have been in the ground um, for a few months now. And so that's a great way to propagate in your garden. If you've got a, a, a woody plant and you want more of that same plant, consider propagating from cuttings. And, and depending on the plant, they often do extremely well and it can be incredibly easy to do. So uh, that's one of those things. Uh, I'll, I'll have videos on that in the future. As, I, as they get a little bit, bit bigger, I've already taken some video of when I started with the cuttings and as the cuttings were growing. And so I'm waiting till the plants actually get established so I can do a start to finish video to show you how you do the cutting and then end up with a plant in the ground. So it's a two year video and that time will come, but definitely something to, to, um, to try out. Steve Kane says, I planted tomatoes in the same bed for three years. Notice yield is dropping off. Plants look healthy, but fewer tomatoes. And this gets back to the concept of adding organic matter. You, you can, and I've done this as well, you can grow the same plant in the same pot, in the same bed, year after year. But you can expect that there will be some nutrient loss in that soil from that plant's that plant that you're growing year after year. And so you'll need to replenish the nutrients. And so by you noticing this, my guess is it's time to amend that soil. It's time to, to get some more organic matter in. If you really want to do it the right way, you do a soil test to find out specifically what nutrients are missing. And you could add a fertilizer. That's more of a short-term fix. I prefer to do the, the amending with the organic matter. And when you have a balanced uh, amending profile, you'll get balanced nutrients. And so that's why I say I like to amend with compost because most compost is made from a mix of materials. And why I like to use the raw materials like the leaves and the grass and anything else that I have as far as plant waste that I'm mixing into my soil because you're making a rich soil. If you just amend with one thing, call it peat moss, if all you ever do is amend your soil with peat moss, well, you're really not adding any new, <laughs> new nutrients other than what peat moss has to offer. It's like if you like pizza and all you ever ate was a cheese pizza, well, sure, you could survive, but you're probably not going to do that great. But if you love pizza and all you're going to do is eat pizza, it's better to have a pizza with everything. To have the mushrooms and the pepperoni and the olives and the bacon and whatever else you like on your pizza. It's the same with the soil. So when we amend our beds, amend with as much of a variety of material as you can. And even if it's just compost, try to use a compost that has as much material as you can find. And so I know some gardeners that, that I've communicated with, 
who say, I use compost. Well, the compost they're using might be like a horse manure compost. And that's the only compost they use is a compost made from horse manure. Well, that's like feeding your plants cheese pizza. They're just getting that one type of soil amendment with that one type of nutrient. And all the rest has been lost. It's been absorbed by the plants and hasn't been replaced. And that's the key to soil amending. You're replacing the lost nutrients by giving the soil organisms food that can now be transferred by that biological action and moved into a form that the plants can uptake. And that takes time. That's why I say when you amend your bed, you should allow weeks before the soil is ready for plants. But regular amending with different materials should give you better results. And especially if you're growing tomatoes in the same spot year after year, Steve, um, start throwing in a bunch of extra uh, ingredients in that soil. And hopefully you'll see uh, improvement next year for the fourth year if you choose to, to grow in that area again. Uh, <clears throat> oh, there you go. Heidi says, have you been to the soil in those beds in the fall or before you planted in the spring? Soil can get depleted. Heidi and I are often on the same wavelength. So um, it's always nice to, to have that input as well. That's great. Okay. Let's see. Sheena says, I do my tubs with branches, then green leaves and brown leaves compost, then potting soil to save money on soil. Uh, and then oh, then when it breaks down, just add more natural compost or potting soil. Yep. Great way to do it. Great system in place. That's definitely the way to do it. And as a result, the tomatoes have grown four feet tall and full of tomatoes. So thanks, Sheena's Keto Prepared Homestead. I appreciate that input. And that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about today. It's work. You got to take time to improve your soil, but you'll definitely see the improved results um, as a result of it. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, excellent, Jay. That was my idea on a fixed income. Super. Okay, and yep, I agree with Mr. Texas Bone. Uh, rabbit manure is a good amendment. And, you know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And again, it's, it's all about variety. We talked a few weeks ago about using the alfalfa pellets. Uh, that's the idea. Rabbit manure, alpaca manure, alfalfa pellets, grass clippings. That's why I say whatever you have available, that's what you should be putting into your soil. If it's organic, there's going to be some soil organism that will feed on it. And there are billions and billions of bacteria in our soil and there are miles and miles of the mycorrhizal network the fungal network that's in our soil and and a lot of it is different you don't just have one type of fungus or one type of bacteria in your bed you have billions of different in, uh, organisms of thousands of different species and so give them different stuff to eat and something will eat it and something will break it down and your plants will benefit as a result of that. So you just got to get out there. Adding it on top is the easiest way. Turning it over is the way I do it. Tilling is an option if you like to do the tilling, though that can really break apart the soil structure and, and create some um, problems. Anand says manure is fine only if you do not have access to good quality compost. And uh, with the compost or manure, as I've, seen, I've said before, knowing the source is good. Uh, I, I, I rarely use manure directly in my soil. Almost always use the manure through my compost system, uh, at just as I've talked recently as well, to, to minimize problems with E. coli or any other pathogens that might be in that manure. But yep, definitely an option. <clears throat> Emily says, does cutting plants at the base when removing instead of pulling out by the roots help to amend the soil? Um, yes, potentially. Depends on the plant. And so um, what you'll find is, and, and I think of it in terms of like, I was talking earlier about the softwood and the hardwood. The roots are kind of the same way. So if you have a, a plant that has a soft root system, like a lettuce, for instance, or a radish, that's a soft, fleshy root. 
And if you leave it in the ground, it's going to decompose pretty quickly and break down. And so if you've got a bed with, with lettuce in it, you can just come through and cut off all the lettuce heads, leave those roots in the ground, and those roots will decompose probably before the next season and enrich the soil. But if you've got a plant like uh, tomato or peppers that have a woodier root, uh, I've experimented with this. Some of you have probably done the same where you cut that plant off at the base in fall, come back in spring, and the root is still there. And it looks like the root has had no decomposition at all. And so there is a different cellular structure in the plant in the type of cells in the root versus the type of cells in the plant. And the root cells are, are basically made to not decompose because you don't want the roots decomposing while the plant is growing. So it takes a lot longer for those bigger, woodier roots to decompose. They will decompose over time, but it takes a longer time. So for those plants, I'll pull them and I'll put them in my compost pile to decompose. And even then, the roots are usually the last thing that breaks down in the compost pile. But for those softer roots, just leaving them in the soil, uh, that can be a quick, fast, easy way to, to get your bed ready for winter if you're not going to turn it over. And yes, yes, those roots can help amend the soil as they break down and add more nutrients to um, what, what the, the soil had before and uh, definitely an option to take. <clears throat> Earthy Artist is wondering if I can put fresh chicken manure on my beds in fall, is it safe to plant in the spring? Yeah, that, that is one of those cases um, with manures. I, I recommend at least six months Nine months is usually better, but uh, that that's an option. And I, and I do that. Uh, in fact, um, you can't see them, but I've got some black plastic bags that I've been sitting kind of in the back of my garden that are filled with chicken manure from my daughter's chickens. And they're waiting for fall because that's exactly what I'm going to do with some of that chicken manure is to amend my beds in fall with chicken manure and not plant in those beds until the spring because yes that does give enough time for the the manure to start breaking down and reduces the risk of any of that potential problem with the e coli or pathogens or many anything else that might be in the chicken manure and so um, definitely consideration definitely something that you can think about so uh, as you can see lots of different things when it comes to amending the soil it, it, there isn't a single answer. You know, I wish I could give you the magic bullet, the one thing you can do. But as I've mentioned throughout today, and that's why I wanted to have this as the topic, there are lots of considerations as far as when to do it, what to use, and how you do it. And it's completely up to you. It's completely up to you in deciding what works best. And so try a couple things. If you've got access to the chicken or the duck manure, go ahead and try that in a bed or two and see if you notice a difference. Uh, when it comes to, to introductory amending or amending for the first time, and Mala's reminding me what time it is, uh, I, I suggest try, especially if you have multiple beds, try with a new amendment in one or two beds rather than starting with the entire garden and then finding out that that amendment was contaminated or you didn't like the results of it. You haven't lost your entire garden you might only have one or two beds that might be affected if things don't go well and so um, that'll be the one of those those points that you've got to decide how much of an amendment you're going to use and which beds but i i amend beds differently i there really isn't a formula or a recipe i use in all of my beds because when i'm staggering my my amending time I've got different amendments at different times of year. And so um, some of these beds have grass clippings and dried leaves and biochar and manure. And some of the beds have a completely different combination based on whatever I had available at that particular time. So be flexible, but definitely do some amending. So let's go ahead and, and move to, to the philosophy point of the, the show as we start wrapping things up. And the words for today are to be thankful. To be thankful for everything you have 
in your life on a daily basis. I think as gardeners, we tend to be more thankful, more appreciative of what's happening in our lives because gardening is tough and we have a lot of failures and we can see the successes and we know what failure and success really looks like. But, but I encourage you to, to look beyond the garden for this. I think gardeners are enthusiastic people. I think they're positive people. I think gardeners really have a good outlook on life. But even for gardeners, adversity happens. And how you approach it can really make a difference in your life. And so that's why I say go ahead and be thankful for the things you have in your life and what's going right. And the reason I bring this up today is that my son was on, in the direct path of Hurricane Ida yesterday. And he and his family actually uh, are in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is where it was supposed to hit. But it veered a little bit at the end and pretty much ran straight into Hammond, Louisiana, which is where my son lives. And so they haven't been back to their house, but their neighbor told them, that a tree fell on their house. So my son, who just bought a house a few months ago, learned today that a tree fell on it in this hurricane. But they're safe. They're, they're doing okay. They'll have to deal with the tree and the house, but if they had been in the house, it could have been a devastating situation. I might not have been able to be on today thinking worst case scenario if they had been in the house when the tree fell on it. So be thankful. I'm, I am so thankful that my son and his family are safe today after getting hit directly by a Category 4 hurricane that may have caused some devastating damage to their house. And we started the day face to face with him calling me and telling me that he's okay and everything is good. So yes, everything is good. There are some things in our lives that are more important than others. Gardening is very important for all of us or you wouldn't be here listening to me talking about gardening. But there are more important things in our lives. You're the one that has to define for you what the different things in your lives have as far as an importance level. For me, family is right there at the top of the list and I'm willing to let my garden die if I have to spend time with my family to help my family get through an emergency event and to look out for their health. And those are my thoughts today. I'm happy that I can go out now and work on my garden. I'll still be in touch with my son to, to find out what kind of damage they actually sustained in the house once they can get to their house because it powers down, the roads are clogged, there's so many issues when a hurricane hits. But I'm thankful that the first thing that happened today right after I got up was to get a call from my son letting me know everything was okay. And I'm thankful that I can go out in the garden and enjoy the gardening day knowing that everything's going to be okay. And I'm thankful that all of you are here with me every Monday helping me get through my gardening week and just my week, my week in general. And I'm glad that I can help you get through your gardening week and your week in general. So I encourage that you, you look at some of the things in your life that maybe you haven't been appreciative enough of and just be thankful for it. Be thankful for everything you have. I know some of you have lost your gardens through storms in recent months. All of us have lost plants that have been because of weather related causes, but they're just plants and we can get back out in the garden and we can grow more. But there's so many other things in our life that we can't necessarily replace. And so we should be thankful for every moment we have to enjoy our life with those things in life that are most important. So I know that is partly gardening, but mostly life. And that's why I wanted to share that with you today as you move forward in the week ahead and just be thankful for all of the good things you have in your life. Even during the adversity when things aren't looking good, 
there's always something that is good that can keep you moving forward. So take that with you. I'll be back in two weeks. Remember, I won't be here next week if you're just signing on late. I'll be back on September 13th and we'll do this all over again to talk more gardening. I'll have more pictures. Hopefully I'll have some pictures from you. And in the meantime, I hope you have some wonderful gardening experiences and some wonderful life experiences. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.